Tesla is a fantastic car. The top end Model S provides for 691 horsepower. It just takes 3.1 seconds to go from 0 to 96 kilometers per hour. And at a top speed of 248 kilometers per hour, who would not want to own this car? And on the highway, the same Tesla will run at a meager 15 kilometers per hour. Add to this, only 1% of all the energy that is taken by this car is actually used to move you from point A to a, point B. Rest all is actually used by the car itself. Cost of driving over a period of last 50 years has reduced substantially. It actually has gone down fivefold. Essentially, it means that the amount of fuel efficiency has improved. You might believe that this will lead you this will lead you to decreased fuel consumption over a period of last 50 years. On the contrary, the fuel consumption, overall fuel consumption by all the cars has increased exponentially. Thanks to the fact that in 50 years back, we had only 50 million cars and today we have 1.4 billion. A typical car is used only two hours a day of the 24 hours we have. Where is it for the rest 22 hours? So we need to have parking places. Parking places essentially means you'll have to disturb the habitats and the land that you need to use. And this points to the fact that, you know, do we really want to move or do we want to own a car? Fur coats are fantastic in Paris because they give you a fashion statement and they also keep you warm. But that's for Paris. What, what if we, I want to you know, wear fur coats in Mumbai? Of course, you leave aside the issue of animal cruelty for a moment. Now, if you want to really do that, I will have to simulate Paris in Mumbai. And that's exactly what we are doing by ensuring that my office building are all air-conditioned, you know, all running at 18 degrees Celsius instead of my Mumbai temperature of a comfortable 27 degrees. Am I, do I need to instead change clothing rather than making sure the air buildings are air conditioned? A question worth asking. Do we want really air, have air conditioners at all is something that we'll deal with as we start looking at questions differently. Also important fact that you should understand is 40% of all the energy that is consumed today and all the carbon emissions associated with that are associated with energy used in construction as well as operation of a building. All of us use internet, right? And internet has become a lifeline for most of us, especially in the urban areas. It is already reaching rural places because of the advent of mobile phones. Do you really know where this originated from? Actually, this whole idea of internet originated in a defense research project and which was targeted for defense applications. Just by changing the perspective, just by changing the way we want to use a particular technology has instead of looking at it from a defense standpoint, we are now looking at benefiting humans on a day to day in everyday life. Now that's something which is completely different than where it originated from. Think of technology, how it can be deployed differently. Now start looking at IoT. All of us know, especially as engineers and computer scientists, that Internet of Things is the thing for today. It's, a, it's be almost becoming a cliche. Everybody talks about IoT. But what does IoT do today? Now, most of the applications of the IoT, which are actually making money, are only in two buckets. One, it either helps you improve production, of course, improve quality, etc., increase production, or it allows you to deliver advertisements so that whatever is produced is sold. Is it really helping individuals who already have a set of products which they don't really buy, don't really want to buy? Hardly. Do we really need to deploy and think about how this technology can be used differently? Probably. Can this be used far better 
to deliver the services that some of the products that are being produced is the question we may want to ask. Are we really looking at an outcome or are we really looking at a product? This kind of perpetual growth cannot really be supported by our finite planet. At one time, maybe a couple of hundred years ago, what started as production for the use of people, for that matter, the idea of why economy exists is that this should deliver benefits to people. And the first idea of production was to create products which will help people's lives, make things easy for people. And that actually, it does did serve that purpose over a period of time. Today, we have to ask a question whether it is doing that. Or are we producing so that the econo wheels of economy continue to run? And to be able to do that, use the technology to deliver advertise advertisements and push these products down people's throat even when they don't really need them. A question worth asking. In the process of this continuous economic growth, we are also adding to pollution. We are also adding to disturbance in natural systems, which are going to come back to us for that matter. They are already coming back to us as these existential problems like climate change. We are now straying substantially from solving problems for people to solving problems for economy and economy for the economy's sake. What we can essentially say is we are producing for the sake of producing. We don't care whether these products are being used and are being helpful. If we truly aim at solving problems for people, we have to start defining these problems differently. As technology evolves, it invariably replaces people. It replaces people and labor by cheap energy. And what in the process we achieve is much higher production in much lesser time. What do we do with these products? Now, these products have to be sold. And therefore, we deployed this technology to figure out how these products could be sold to people, whether or not they really need them. And of course, the associated issues of additional use of material, energy, creating pollutions, don't go anywhere. It increases the rate at which the natural resources are extracted. And in the paradigm of this growth economy, this will never stop. Instantaneous communication is something that we really love. Because you know we can talk to our friends any second. But what does it do to business? Now, instantaneous communication has increased the speed at which we make decisions. And every decision that we make lands up touching a natural resource. For example, I decide to buy a pump tomorrow or I decide to buy a car the day after. Now, every time I make that decision, I am going to need a mine from where the iron is picked up to delivering that car to your home where transportation is done and fossil fuels are used. So the point I'm making is every decision that is made either by a consumer eventually or by a business leads to increased stress on natural resources. Do we really want to extract natural resources efficiently and quickly or do we want to solve problems effectively by simply deploying technology differently? Let us look at some interesting observations, interesting questions that we may want to ponder on. Do we want to own a car or do we want to move? Can we say that mobility as a service is better or owning a car and being congested in traffic is better? A good example, and it's still just a start, is a model which has been adopted by Ola and Uber. So now, instead of having a car park 22 hours of the 24 hours a day, the car continues to move. So now instead of serving one person, it's going to start serving at least 12 persons. A better utilization of all the energy materials that we have already used in constructing a car. Whether this model can be further improved, of course, yes. But it's a great start. Also, re-emphasizing that the car actually uses 99% of the energy to move itself. 
and not the passenger. The energy used to move a passenger is just mere 1%. Another example, we sit many times, especially professionals in an air-conditioned office. And we take pride that my office is air-conditioned. Now, do we really want to own an air conditioner or we just want to be comfortable? A question worth asking. Fortunately, some of the companies have started thinking about it. And Carrier, which is one of the prime brands in air conditioners, has started looking at delivering what they call as Cooleth. Right? Cooleth is a term for providing cool air instead of trying to sell air conditioners. Now, does that have some other interesting implications? We shall see. Do we have to really need and own a bunch of tube lights? Probably our intention is not to own a tube light, but to nicely sit and read in a corner where there is sufficient light. So can we look at lighting as a service? Again, we are fortunate, there is a good start. Philips in Netherlands is delivering this service to Amsterdam airport. The Schiphol airport today at Amsterdam does not own a single lighting fixture. What they say is you deliver lighting as a service to my customers who are sitting in a cafe wanting to read a book. Now that makes sense, right? So Philips then gets a few dollars every month from the airport and it continues to make sure that light is available when, where it is required all the time, 24 hours a day. Do we want to own vacation homes everywhere on the planet? Probably we cannot afford that, right? But we have a solution. We don't really need that, but we still want to do vacations. We want to make sure that we take a break. Now that can happen only if we have a mechanism. Do we have that mechanism accommodation as a service? Absolutely yes. We now have Airbnb who are trying to use existing assets. So they're not building new properties, mind you. They're actually using existing houses, existing assets, existing resorts to make sure that they're utilized better. And I think it's a great first step towards figuring out some of these areas as well. You drink water every day. Many of you drink water from bottles. I don't know whether you really need bottles or you need to drink you know, uh, clean water. There are many FMCGs who are trying to sell purifiers. And many, many times, everybody knows AquaGuard in India. It's one very famous brand. Do you really know, want to own AquaGuard or you want to make sure that the water delivered to you is pure? Good part is many FMCG, FMCGs are trying to make a shift. And this shift is from delivering you an equipment to delivering you an outcome of the equipment. So they want to now say that, yeah, I will give you good, clean drinking water at a small cost. You don't have to buy a water purifier. And that's a great step again. Everybody at one point in time wanted to buy computers with you know, highest specifications. They wanted to play games or you know, what have you. Storage became very important when movies started becoming available. You know, everybody wanted to download a bunch of movies and wanted to watch these movies on their on their uh, PCs, right? No more. Suddenly came Netflix. And Netflix now delivers movies on demand. You don't really need to store them. That is the power of technology being used properly. Of course, all of us want to be entertained. But do we really need to store 1,000 movies on your hard disk? I doubt. So we have now technologies like cloud, you know, storage on demand, compute on demand available to us. And those are again good steps to make sure that the services can be delivered rather than the products. Do we want to buy a copier? All of us know that, you know, we take copies every now and then. Do we really want to buy a copier for that purpose? You know, in the past, you know, when I was working for that matter, you know, we used to own in an offices a copier, at least one if not many. <clears throat> and that was capital investment, mind you. I had to spend a whole lot of money to buy a copier. That's no more required. You now, Xerox today almost stopped selling copiers. What they say is I will rather sell you 
a service and I'll deliver you copies whenever and whenever you want them. So I for now as a consumer, I don't have to invest in a copier anymore. I just have to buy copies as and when I need them. An interesting service. Now look at a broader social problem, which is waste. We know in urban spaces, waste is a huge problem. Now, are we wanting to manage our waste better? Or do we really want to eliminate waste altogether? I think it's a question worth asking. Can we actually go to the root of the problem and ask a question as to where the waste is created? Or we want to make sure that now the waste is created, how to manage it? So right question to ask ourselves is, are we asking the right questions? Are we solving the right problems? Early 2000s, I was able to lay hand on a fantastic book called Natural Capitalism. Amory Lovins and his team wrote this phenomenal book way back, 25 years ago. Have we taken enough cognizance of that? Just about. Hardly, I would say. Right? They talked about one very interesting concept of the four that they talked about, which is service and flow economy. And I would like to ensure that I emphasize on that a little bit more because that has been less talked about relatively. Even, I've given, even while I've given you a few examples. Now, service and flow economy or turning a product into a service is an interesting idea. Why? Because it allows alignment of sellers and buyers' interests. And it might kind of seem counterproductive or counterintuitive that, you know, seller wants to sell more and you're saying that, you know, seller should sell less. How can that happen? Right? But let's take an example. Right? Let's say that, you know, carrier starts delivering comfort as a service, you know, at 100 rupees a month. If you went on to buy an air conditioner, you'll land up spending 40,000 rupees to buy an air conditioner. What would you choose as a buyer? Naturally, something which is cheap, which gives me what I really want. But what is there in this as a seller? No, seller will now start, you know, only earning 100 rupees instead of 40,000. That's also not the case. For a reason that this 100 rupees a month is going to go on for years. Once a customer, a satisfied customer of carrier, he is not going to go anywhere. So you are creating what I call as a revenue stream. And the quality of revenue is a very interesting term that is talked about in business is how can you create revenue streams and not landslide revenue in one year and nothing in the second. Now this is interesting. This is interesting. Now, it is interesting for a seller to create a revenue stream. The seller doesn't sell a product at all. So the air conditioner is owned by carrier. I am responsible for maintaining, managing, and reincarnating the same air conditioner so that I can kind of use it perpetually. I have my own responsibility to ensure that it long, lasts long, it can be maintained very easily, it delivers the service for my customer, and I need not throw it away at the end of life. Now, all is again very well aligned to the third point which I want to make, which is this automatically reduces the load on natural resources. I will, I'm going to lead, need less, I need to produce less, I need to consume only as much I want, and the natural resources automatically are correspondingly going to reduce. So I'm benefiting all the three stakeholders in my, in a single shot. To sum up, I would like to say, are we framing our problems rightly is a question that we must ask. Are we really asking the right questions is the question that we must ask. Thank you.